Hey, good morning, Christ Point. Welcome to the barn. I want to share a verse before we jump into worship um, that was really encouraging to me uh, this week. Um, it comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. It says, each time he said, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. So now I'm glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. Verse 10 says, that's why I take pleasure in my weaknesses and in the insults, hardships, persecutions, and troubles that I suffer for Christ. For when I'm weak, and I'm strong. If you're feeling weak this morning, if you're feeling tired, um, I want to welcome you. Um, let's stand and let's worship. There is strength and there's peace in the name of Jesus. Let's sing. Who sells the sun to rise every morning? Colors the sky with the shades of his glory wakes us with mercy in the Lord Jesus does Who holds the orphan and comforts the widow cries for injustice feels every sorrow peace the faint of his children Jesus does. So we sing praise to the Father who gave us the Son. Praise to the Spirit who's living in us. I was a sinner. He saved me from who I was. Is that what Jesus Sin and sours his grace over all our mistakes, washes us clean with his blood. Jesus, Lord, who sings the soul a sweet forgiveness, who stole the keys to hell and the grave, who hides. Power to say, Jesus died. So we sing praise to the Father who gave us the Son. Praise to the Spirit who's living in us. When I was a sinner, He saved me from who I Worthy of 
of every song we could ever sing. Worthy you for all praise we could ever bring. Worthy you of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one you could ever see. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. Holy, there is no one like you. None beside you open up my eyes in wonder. Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Above every other name, Jesus, the only one you could ever say. You're worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you, oh, we live for you. Holy, there is no one like you. There is Inside you, open up my eyes in wonder. Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me.
hope that I don't wake up Until I lay my head Oh, I will see Of the goodness of God So my life you have been faithful And all my life you have been so, so good Every breath that I have made Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God I love your voice Let me through the fight in darkest night. You were close like no other, and I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend, and I have lived in the goodness of God. So my life. You have been faithful And all my life You have been so, so good With every breath that I am able Oh, I will see Of the goodness of God Your goodness is running after running after me your goodness is running after it's running after me With my life laid down surrendered now and I give you everything your goodness is running after it's running after me your goodness is running after running after me your goodness is running after it's running after me With my life laid down surrendered now and I give you everything oh, your goodness is running after it's running after me so my life you have been faithful All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I have made Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God So my life you have been My life, you have been so, so good. Every breath that I have made, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Will you pray with me? Uh, Jesus, um, you continue to pursue us. Your goodness is, you're the very definition of goodness. Your grace and your mercy um, are more than enough. The gospel that you um, cause to happen, the good news that you that is you, your life death and resurrection is the essence of life. Um, it's the best news we'll ever hear. I pray that you let us um, see that and experience that even now. Thank you for coming after me. Thank you for coming after us. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. 
Today's passage is from John chapter 12, uh, starting in verse 27 through verse 36. This is Jesus talking. Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd that stood there and heard it said that it had thundered. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake, not mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show by what kind of death he was going to die. So the crowd answered him, We have heard from the law that the Christ remains forever. How can you say that the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? So Jesus said to them, The light is among you for a little while longer. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. The one who walks in the darkness does not know where he is going. While you have the light, believe in the light that you may become sons of light. At this time, I would like to dismiss our children in kindergarten through fifth grade to CP kids. As usual, parents, make sure you pick them up. At the end of the service, we have had a couple issues with parents forgetting their children. They will remain nameless. Uh, As many of you are probably aware, uh, this weekend is the busiest shopping weekend of the year. It is, it's true. Just look at the statistics. I've I've been giving this some thought recently. Admittedly, I'm not much of a shopper. I prefer to do things online. Uh, But in terms of individuals who go to brick and mortar stores, I have determined that there are two types of shoppers. Two types of shoppers. I have literally uh, zero statistics to prove this, but it's just my thought. So you can forget about it in two minutes. Um, There is the shopper who goes to the store to browse. They're, They're just there to browse. They walk into a store to meander. They walk in. They're greeted by the salesman, by the saleswoman, They say hello, they tell them about all the sales that are taking place at the store. Remember, it ends this weekend. Make sure you take advantage of the sales. If you can't find your color or your size, there's more in the back. I'll be happy to get it uh, for you. And that person listens intently. They strike up a conversation. They become quasi-best friends with the salesperson. Uh, They walk down the store, throughout the store, and they, uh, they see a sweater or maybe a shirt, and they think to themselves, I like that. That looks nice. I think it would look nice on me. That might be my color. I'm not sure. I think I'm, I think I'm in autumn, but I might be a cool summer or spring. I'm not really sure. I like that. I think it would complement my shoes that I have, but I don't have a belt for that. I'm not sure if, if I should make that purchase or not. And they walk through the store, and they literally touch everything. They're meandering. They're browsing. Three days later, They walk out of the store with nothing. That's that's one kind of shopper. Uh, The other kind of shopper is someone who shops on mission. They know what they want. They've studied the layout of the store. Don't ask me how they got the blueprints, but they did. They're well aware of all the sales. They go with one particular sweater in mind. They know what they want. They know where to find it. They walk in and they are intentional about not making eye contact with the salesperson. They're not there for chit chat. They're there for a sweater. And so they walk in, their eyes meet, the sweater is about three quarters of the way into the store and they pounce like a cheetah chasing a gazelle. They grab the sweater, they run to the front desk, they check out, they're in and out in 60 seconds. Meanwhile, 17 people who are meandering through the store have passed them by. 
But this person is on mission. They are like a Navy SEAL in there, in and out. The only way that you would know that they were actually there is if you looked at the video in the back. Two different ways to shop. One, to browse, to meander, and the other way, shop on mission. Uh, There are multiple ways that you can live your life. You can browse. You can meander, or you can live on mission. And this morning, I want to encourage you to live on mission. And I want to encourage you to live on mission uh, because Jesus uh, lived this way. Uh, Jesus was the most mission-minded man ever to walk the planet. And so this morning, I want us to look at the mission of uh, Christ, and I want us to consider five ways that he pursued his mission. Uh, The mission of Christ was simply to glorify his Father, to glorify the Father. John chapter 12, verse 27 reads, Now my soul is troubled, what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose, I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Jesus comes uh, to the end of his life, and he uh, reiterates his mission that he has been given. And the mission of Christ is to glorify his Father. It goes without saying, but Jesus did not live an aimless life. He did not walk through this life and simply drift. Uh, He was the most mission-minded man ever. Uh, Jesus lived a purpose-driven life way before any pastor wrote a book about it. And his purpose uh, was to glorify God. Now, I say that, and that may sound rather churchy to you. You may have heard that saying or that phrase before, glorify God. But what does it mean? What does it mean to glorify uh, the Father? When Scripture talks about bringing glory to God, it means a going public with the greatness or the holiness of God. When Jesus prays, Father, glorify your name, he is praying that the world would see the greatness of God. God, you are great, and I want other people to see just how great you really are. I want other people to see you. Jesus lived for God's glory in all that he did. His purpose, his stated mission, uh, was not easy. Uh, Living for God's glory is not an easy way uh, to live. When Jesus neared the end of his life, he prayed, Now my soul is troubled. There are some translations will say deeply troubled. The idea here in the original text is one of revulsion or horror or anxiety or agitation. When Jesus reached the end of his life and said, my soul is troubled because he was living for God's glory, uh, he was admittedly uh, confessing to the fact that the road he would travel would not be an easy one. In other words, Jesus was not out of touch with reality. Isaiah chapter 53, in describing the life of Christ well before Jesus rolled onto the scene, said of Christ that he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. This was uh, the life of Christ. Matthew chapter 26, verse 36, as Jesus nears the end of his life, uh, reads that Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. And then he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. 
Um, Jesus knew the cost of bringing glory to the Father. Um, The life of Christ was not an easy life. Uh, Sometimes when we think about the Christian life, we think the Christian life is a pursuit of comfort or ease or our very best life uh, right here and right now. And yet when you read through the pages of Scripture and you study the life of Jesus, you will oftentimes find just the opposite of that. Um, You will find a difficult life and a hard life. You will find a life of rejection uh, from others. Jesus did not win many popularity contests. The people who were most influential in that day and age are the very same people uh, who rejected Christ. And so when Jesus um, prays at the end of his life that God would receive glory in his life, he is well aware of the cost of his mission. Clarity of mission in life oftentimes comes with an awareness of the cost of mission. Clarity of mission often comes with an awareness of the cost of mission. Those two are often inseparable. They certainly were for Jesus. Jesus laid down his life for the glory of God. He laid down his life so that other people would be able to see the value and the worth of his Father. If you are here this morning and you are looking for a purpose for your life, uh, if you are a student and you're dreaming about what God might have for you in the days ahead, uh, if you are someone who is here this morning and single and you are dreaming about what life could look like for you as a single person or if you're married or if you're middle-aged or if you're a little more mature and you have passed the first half of life, and are well into the second half, or maybe even the fourth quarter. And you are wondering, what should I do with my days on this earth? How should I live? What should I live for? Uh, May I suggest to you uh, that the mission of Jesus is a good mission to adopt. Uh, Living your life for uh, the glory of God is a good aim uh, in this life. And it is actually a biblical aim. Like you don't have to make it up or dream it up if you're looking for purpose this morning. Uh, Just do what God's word uh, calls us to do. Just live the way that God's word calls us to live. This is why you and I were created. This is what we were made for. Isaiah chapter 43, verses 6 and 7, I will say to the north, give up, and to the south, do not withhold I bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the end of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. If you are wondering why God created you or made you or what God has for you, um, his aim for your life is found in verse 7. He created you for his glory. He formed you and made you so that people would see uh, the greatness of God in your life. And so make it your aim in all that you do to bring glory to God. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Uh, 20 years ago, I found myself uh, in my junior year at seminary. I was pursuing a four-year degree, a THM degree at Dallas Theological Seminary, and I was experiencing kind of a unique time in in life. I was uh, wrestling in my own heart with what God wanted me to do with my days here on this planet. When I was a senior in high school, I felt called to vocational ministry. Uh, When I was a senior in college, I started questioning uh, what in the world God was up to in my life. I didn't know if I was pursuing ministry for the right reasons. I questioned somewhat what God had in store for me in the days ahead. Uh, And I ended up pursuing seminary and thinking to myself, I'm going to go for four years, I'm going to get through this, and I'm going to go into pastoral ministry. But a crazy thing happened when I was at Dallas Seminary. I saw my friends, people that I knew literally for years, who were on the same path as me, who tapped out. They didn't leave the faith. They didn't abandon the faith. But they began pursuing uh, other things. I had a friend that ended up going into law. I had another friend uh, that went into computer science. These these people who were close to me, uh, who were walking alongside of me, and all of a sudden, I looked up, and they were gone. 
And I wondered to myself, God, is that what you have for me? Like, what, what am I doing here? I was married at the time. Melissa and I didn't have any children. And I just wondered if I was pursuing pastoral ministries for the right reasons. And during that time of reflection and prayer, I came across a book. And uh, this book was published some 20 years ago in, uh, in 2003. And it's a book by the author John Piper. And it's titled, Don't Waste Your Life. And I remember reading a paragraph that, I don't want to say changed the trajectory of my life, but it affirmed and confirmed uh, what God was doing in my heart. Books oftentimes do this, by the way. You read a book, and seldom do you remember the whole thing. Uh, oftentimes, you'll remember a quote or two, a passage or two, a paragraph or two. You know, something that you highlight, that you circle, that you go back to. And, and, and I highlighted and circled and drew arrows to this paragraph and have gone back to it many times over the course of the last 20 years. Uh, John Piper writes in his book, Don't Waste Your Life, you don't have to know a lot of things for your life to make a lasting difference in the world. But you do have to know the few things that matter, perhaps just one, and then be willing to live for them and die for them. The people that make a durable difference in the world are not the people who have mastered many things, but who have been mastered by one great thing. If you want your life to count, if you want the ripple effect of the pebbles you drop to become waves that reach to the ends of the earth and roll on into eternity, you don't need to have a high IQ. You don't have to have good looks or riches or come from a fine family or a fine school. Instead, you have to know a few great, majestic, unchanging, obvious, simple, glorious things, or one great, all-embracing thing, and be set on fire by them. When I read that, that struck me as very good news. When I read, if you want your life to count, if you want the ripple effect of the pebbles you drop to become waves that reach to the end of the earth and roll on into eternity, you don't need to have a high IQ. You don't have to have good looks or riches or come from a fine family or a fine school. I thought to myself, I check all of those boxes. <laughs> and then I read, instead, you have to know a few great, majestic, unchanging, obvious, simple, glorious things or one great, all-embracing thing, and be set on fire by them. I thought, I can live and die for that. I can live and die for that. Let God's glory be your all-embracing one thing. Let it be your one thing. Let it impact and affect everything you do here on this earth. Let it influence and impact and drive you as you consider how to spend your time on planet earth. Let it motivate and move you as you pursue relationships with one another, whether it's a friendship, whether it is a marriage, whether you are a parent or a student, a son or a daughter, let God's glory drive how you spend the resources that God has entrusted to you. Let it demonstrate that you value God and His glory uh, more than life itself. Live for God's glory and live for God's glory whether you grow up to be a pastor or a pilot, whether you are a student or you sell software, whether you're in sales or you are a CEO, uh, whether you are a manager or a stay-at-home mom, whatever you do in life, live for God's glory. You will not regret it. You won't regret it. And here is some very good news to remind you of in case you need a reminder. Uh, as you pursue living for God's glory, you will do so imperfectly, daily. You will do it imperfectly. Jesus, Jesus did it perfectly. 
This is very good news. This is what we are reminded of when we come to the text this morning. How did Jesus live his life for the glory of God? How was God the Father glorified in God the Son? Well, we're told in the text, uh, God is glorified when dead people are raised to life. Look at the text. John chapter 7, verse 21, Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose, I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. What is God talking about when he says, I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again? I believe that God the Father is talking about how he has raised dead people back to life. God the Father is going, I have done that. Jesus, you've raised people back to life, and I'll do it again. What is the Father referring to? He is referring to the Son. Just as Jesus raised people from the dead, God the Father is going to raise Jesus from the dead. When dead people are raised to life, God is glorified. Because that's unusual, is it not? I tell people all the time, resurrections on the whole are not going up. It's rare. And when it happens, God is glorified. God is seen as great. I believe that this is true, not only of physical resurrections, the handful of them that we read about in Scripture. I believe that it is true of spiritual resurrections as well. When we are spiritually dead and God, by the power of His Spirit, breathes life into us and makes us spiritually alive, that's a miracle. That's a miracle. When you talk to 100 people and you share the gospel, and maybe 99 of them are like, okay, dude, get away from me. That's crazy talk. And, and then there's one, maybe, that says, I, like, I believe. I'm in. If you're a Christian here this morning, that happened to you somewhere along the line. Maybe it happened when you were five or when you were 15 or when you were 50. Maybe it happens today. Like you walked in here and you're like, whatever, like I'll go. I'm not happy about it. And and you hear the good news of the gospel and you go, man, I'm in. That's a miracle when that happens. Uh, God is glorified when dead people are raised to life. Uh, God is also glorified when just judgment is made. God judged the world uh, with the death of Christ. John chapter 12, verse 31 reads, Now is the judgment of this world. I think about it. We don't like to talk about this, right? This is not like happy Christmas devotional, but, uh, but it is, or it can be, It can be, because Jesus came to to judge the world. We see this in other places in John's gospel. Jesus had the authority to judge. He had the authority, John 5, 27. And God has given Jesus authority to execute judgment because he is uh, the son of man. Judgment uh, happens in and through uh, Jesus. He's been given authority by uh, the Father. This judgment that Scripture talks about is both a future judgment and a right now judgment. When you read about judgment in Scripture, there is this sense where oftentimes Scripture is talking about an event that will take place uh, somewhere in the future. I think of John chapter 5, verses 28 and 29 that read, An hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will come out, those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and to those who have done evil to the resurrection of the dead. So there is a future judgment that's coming after the resurrection of all God's people, Uh, both uh, the good and the evil. This isn't referring to God weighing the deeds of the good and evil and going, okay, like, you've done enough good, you're good, or you've done bad, you're bad. It doesn't doesn't work that way. But Scripture is saying that there is a judgment uh, that is to come for people who have not uh, trusted in Jesus. 
But when Jesus came and lived and died and rose again, uh, he came with a just judgment that is present day here and now. In other words, the judgment that Jesus uh, came down with impacts you and me today. How did that happen? Our text tells us, now is the judgment of this world. Now, right now, the death of Jesus becomes the decisive dividing line uh, between those who are condemned and those who are vindicated. If you trust in Jesus, Scripture tells us there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. I mean, just think about that. That blows my mind. When you trust in Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, there is no condemnation. I mean, how many times have you gone through life marked by a decision that you've made that's been bad? Like, it's one of those things that you don't advertise, you don't lead with it in conversations. Like, nobody asks you, hey, how are you doing today? And you go, you know, I don't know if I ever told you what I did 17 years ago when I was in college. Some of it's blurry, but let me just share it with you. No, you keep it close to the vest, right? And you typically do that if it happened 17 years ago or if it happened 17 minutes ago. And what happens is those decisions oftentimes bring us guilt and shame. They're used by the enemy to condemn us. Right, so we, we walk through life and we're somehow thinking or believing that the decisions that we've made in the past define who we are. But, but when Jesus comes and offers just judgment, Scripture is teaching us that He paid for our very worst. He paid for our sins. Right, so the enemy can't hold them up in front of our faces and say, remember what you've done? Remember what you did? Let me remind you. Oh, no. No, Jesus paid for that. He paid for that. There is therefore now no condemnation uh, for those who are in Christ Jesus. That is true of past sins and present sins and future sins. There's nobody that can say uh, to us, what were you thinking when you did that or you said that? What was going through your mind? You say you're a Christian, but look at your life. You're a mess. That is the voice of the enemy. There is freedom in Christ because of the work of Christ. There is no condemnation. That means that sin does not have final say in your life or in mine. A God is glorified when the righteous judge condemns the guilty or vindicates of those who trust in Jesus. God the Father is also glorified when the enemy is defeated. Look at John chapter 12, verse 31. Now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. Now I read that and I think to myself, well, wait a second. Are the ruler of this world cast out? Satan is defeated? Like, how does that work? Because it sure seems like as we navigate through life, there is an enemy. Right? I mean, you just, like, look around. Not just out there, but like in here. It seems like there's an enemy. It seems like there is an enemy who seeks to steal, kill, and destroy. So how, like, how does all of that work? Because here we're told that judgment has come into the world and now the ruler of this world will be cast out. What I believe that Jesus is referring to here is the work of the enemy or the work of Satan trying to move Jesus off mission as he neared the end of his life. And yet, despite the fact that Jesus was tempted, he was not defeated. Right? And so, so we know that there has been a decisive defeat of Satan, even though that defeat is not yet final. We know this because there's other places in the Bible that encourage us uh, to, to use our weapons of warfare against our enemy. Like we're told in Ephesians, put on the full armor of God. We know that there's an enemy in the world that seeks to steal, uh, kill, and destroy. A Satan is a defeated foe, but he is not a dormant one. Uh, he still moves and he still acts. And yet, we have this beautiful reminder here that our enemy uh, has been defeated. Uh, God is also glorified not only when the enemy is defeated, but he is glorified when God's sons and daughters are rescued. 
John chapter 12, verse 31. Now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show by what kind of death he was going to die. So the crowd answered him, We have heard from the law that Christ remains forever. How can you say that the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is the Son of Man? Uh, We're taught in this verse that Jesus rescues his sons and daughters uh, through the cross. He brings spiritually dead people back to life. Um, God the Father is glorified when God the Son accomplished his mission. But there isn't some sense in this passage where God is inviting us to figure things out. Instead, we are reminded of the finished work of Christ on the cross. He is the one uh, who was lifted up for you and for me. The work of Christ is uh, definitive in our hearts and in our lives. We see this in other places uh, in Scripture. We see it in other places in the gospel, that Jesus actually accomplished something on the cross. John chapter 6, verse 44 No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. How does God draw his people? Like, he draws them through the work of Christ, by the Spirit. The Father is drawing them. John 10, 16, And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock and one shepherd. John chapter 11, verses 51 through 52, He did not say this of his own accord, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation, and not for the nation only, but also to gather into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. In other words, Jesus is teaching in the gospel, I have a people, and they are mine, and I am coming for them. I am going to rescue them. There is a difference between a firefighter who stands outside a burning building and makes a decision to go in and to rescue those uh, who are lost, and a firefighter who stands outside the fire and simply shouts, save yourself, save yourself. Jesus went into the fire. He went into the fire and he said, you are mine. This is how God rescues his children. How does he do that? Like, what means does Jesus use to bring people who are far from him near? Well, the means that he uses is faith. He uses faith. John chapter 12, verse 35, Jesus said to them, The light is among you for a little while longer. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. The one who walks in darkness does not know where he is going. While you have the light, believe in the light that you might become sons of light. Scripture uses this imagery all throughout uh, the Bible, this this imagery of light and darkness. Those who walk in darkness do not know Jesus. They do not have light. Um, Those who have light, who believe in Jesus, have life. This is why Jesus said in John chapter 8, verse 12, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Uh, Christ's mission uh, was to glorify uh, the Father. He glorified the Father by bringing dead people back to life, by justly judging the world, by defeating the enemy, by securing a people for himself, and by calling a people uh, to become children of God, to walk in the light. Can I ask you a question this morning, church family? Do you know the light? Uh, Do you have life? Have you trusted in Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins? Um, Do you know that Jesus was fully God and fully man? Uh, He was sent by God the Father on a rescue mission uh, to this earth to do what you and I could never do, uh, to live a perfect life and to die a sinner's death. Uh, to be buried, but to be raised back to life three days later. Uh, Because of the work of Jesus, you and I uh, have the offer 
of eternal life with God forever by faith, not trusting in our works, anything that we say or could do, but by trusting in the finished work of Jesus. If you do not know Jesus this morning, I invite you um, to walk in the light and experience the light that he offers. You can choose to live this morning one of two ways. You can choose uh, to meander uh, through life, or you can choose uh, to live on mission. Uh, By the power of God, uh, may you choose that mission uh, to glorify uh, God. Would you pray with me? Father God, thank you so much for uh, your kindness that you have demonstrated to us through Jesus. Uh, Lord, thank you that uh, you are the life giver. Uh, Lord, thank you that you have a people for uh, yourself, sons and daughters that you have called uh, to know you and to follow you and to walk with you. Lord, if there are people who are far from you this morning, I pray uh, by the power of the living God that you would move in their hearts in such a way uh, that you would instill faith into their hearts. Lord, that you would draw them to yourself. Uh, God, for us, I pray that we would uh, live lives on mission. Lord, our time is short on planet Earth. I pray that you would help us make the most of it. Uh, God, we love you. We thank you so much that you loved us first. We pray these things in Jesus' name and by your Spirit. Amen. Would you stand with me as we sing?
a seat. I was just thinking as I was singing that song, my dad, uh, <laughs> he texted me this morning and uh, my grandmother many years ago, it was probably 10, ten years ago now, uh, went to be with, with Jesus today and he said, hey, this is the anniversary date of grandma's passing. And I just was thinking to myself, man, that's a, that's a good day. Like, that's a good day uh, to see Jesus face to face. That's cool. Um, if you are new to Christ Point, I want to welcome you. My name is James. I have the great joy and privilege of serving as a pastor uh, here at Christ Point. We exist to point people to Jesus. Uh, if you are new to Christ Point and you are looking uh, at, like, how do I take my next steps? Where do I go from here? I want to encourage you to take out the connection card in the seat back in front of you. There's a little QR code on there that you can scan. Let us know that you were here this morning. If you would rather not do that, you can fill that out with a pen, a pencil, a marker, a crayon, uh, chalk. We also accept. Place it in the black offering box on your way out uh, this morning. If you are here this morning and you are interested in making an eternal investment, uh, an investment that will be felt for all of eternity, if you're interested in giving financially uh, to Christ Point, you can uh, put an offering in the black box in the back, or you can also give online. Everything that we do is, is a church family, whether it's meeting here on Sunday morning, whether it's our commitment to missions both here and around the world uh, in, in so many ways is supported uh, through your generosity and through your gifts. And so we give thanks to God uh, that, uh, that you are here, that we are a generous church, and it is a joy to be able to be a part of what God is doing. Uh, if you are wondering what's taking place at Christ Point this next month, it's kind of a, you know, it's a big month in churches. Uh, around the country and around the world, December, you know, because Christmas and everything. Um, and so if you are wondering what's taking place here at CP, I want to let you know, ladies, we have a Christmas party uh, on the 1st this week. Uh, I believe that that is a Friday evening. If you're looking for more information, uh, you can read your Christ Point news that goes out every Friday morning if you haven't already done so. Uh, you can also download the Church Center app and find out everything that's taking place. Uh, our Advent series kicks off next week on the 3rd. Uh, if there is someone who God has placed in your life uh, who is not currently connected to a church home, uh, December is a great month to extend an invitation to invite a friend, a family member, a neighbor to come and attend. Also want to let you know, December the 17th, uh, we have our tacky Christmas, uh, Christmas, what are we calling it? Taxi Christmas sweater contest. Yes, there was, last, last year things got a little dicey uh, with some of the judging that took place. Uh, I don't think we need to rehash that, but we're going to iron out those details. We're going to make sure uh, that who's ever deserving of the prize this year uh, wins the prize. Um, it could be me. I don't know. Um, and then our Christmas service is uh, on Christmas Eve, the 24th. Uh, because Christmas lands on a Sunday this, this year, we're going to have our service in the morning, 1030 in the morning. We will not have an evening service, but please come uh, and celebrate the birth of uh, Jesus with your church family. Um, I want to encourage you to come. You don't want to miss that. That following week, we will not meet on the 31st. Uh, God bless you, church family. It's a joy to be able to worship with you this morning. We'll see you next week at 1030. God bless.